match driving mm. is to me it's a brilliant idea and trying to I hope we can talk more about it uh, in, this, in this podcast yeah, yeah. happy to all right oh, this, yeah. um, David you can see my name here <laughs> yeah <laughs> David you pronounce it yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, my friend Pepe here has a, an amazing podcast and YouTube channel on philosophy and science. It's really, really inspiring. So we're very excited to have So, you. so what's, what's your background, Pepe? Oh, uh, it is um, non-existent, basically. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I just read a bunch of stuff and, and, share, and share all that, uh, all that, uh, uh, that I'm passionate about with, with people online. And lately, uh, well, first of all, we're live. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, okay. for doing this. Uh, we, uh, we've been reading your book, The, Vi the Vital Question, for like, uh, what's it, a couple of months now? Uh, well, they've been reading it uh, uh, since since earlier, uh, but the, the first moment they introduced me to it, it, it was like... Uh, I've been I've been pondering this this subject the the origins of life uh, for for a while now, but I've never seen it through this uh, uh, through this lens before. So first of all, let me tell you I'm an absolute fan. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, mm. uh, before we start, w would you like to to tell us a little bit about yourself and and your background? Uh, what kind of life do you need to live uh, to start uh, working along the lines of wondering what is the origin of life? <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, I mean, I can tell you about me. I can't tell you more generally how you should do it. Um, <laughs> in, in my own case, uh, kind of, it's a bit of a strange story. Um, so I, 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 at school, I enjoyed chemistry, I enjoyed biology, so I thought, well, I'll go and do a degree in biochemistry then, because that's the best of both worlds. Uh, and as soon as I got there, I, this was to Imperial College, and I, I just didn't like the course. I didn't like biochemistry anymore. Um, I kind of opted out and went climbing instead quite a lot. Uh, and I would have like went rock climbing. climbing a lot. I used to hitchhike around the country and go, go climbing in Scotland and Wales and in the Alps and places, and in America, actually, in, in, in California on a couple of occasions as well. Yeah. That's a scary place. <laughs> uh, Yosemite <laughs> Valley. <laughs> don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. Uh, anyway, um, so I, I would have probably, if it were today, just have stopped and gone and done something else. Um, but I didn't know what else to do either. Uh, and so, and I got a bit of a debt, so I needed to get a job. And I got a job in a, in a research lab because it was all I knew what to do. Uh, and it turned out I loved research. I, I really <laughs> thrived. I mean, as soon as people stopped telling me what I had to remember and just said, go away and do stuff, yeah. then I started <laughs> to enjoy it. So, I mean, I think that's me rather than anybody else. Uh, but I suspect a lot of scientists are probably a bit like that, that they, they, they you know, people have independent minds and don't like being told how to think. Um, so I think that was the problem I had with my degree. I was being told how to think and I, I, I just, I wish I reacted better to that, but I, I don't react well to it. What was anyway, your so, research about? Well, this was to do with organ transplantation. Nice. Um, to do specifically with what's called ischemia reperfusion injury. So what happens if you uh, transplant an organ and, and as soon as you, as soon as you uh, plug it back in again and the blood starts to flow again, uh, you have a problem. It's not just the immunological rejection going on, it's also oxygen-free radicals. So oxygen itself can be toxic and can cause damage uh, to, to the mitochondria and to the organs to the point that they fail. Is this when so you started you writing about your book on oxygen? Well, yes. So that was... The book was later, but it was grounded in, 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 in that. That was what my PhD was on. And a lot of it was to do, well, when, when I'd finished the PhD, uh, I, 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 I knew I was going nowhere with that. So I kind of come as far as I could go. And yeah. I didn't know what else, you know, I, I, basically it was all to do with antioxidants and free radicals. And I tried all kinds of antioxidants to try and preserve uh, organs for longer, kidneys. Uh, and none of them really ever worked. And I came to the point where I just thought, this is not just that they don't 
work because they're not getting there at a high enough concentration or the, the right time. I thought there's a serious problem with the whole conception of antioxidants. They just don't work. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, I don't think I've really changed my mind. I mean, we have a really tight control over the redox state of cells. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's as tight as the, the, the salt balance or the pH or something. We really don't let that go. So, so I, I ended up getting a job writing for a while for, uh, for, for medical education edu companies which I had no idea they existed, but I'd just been looking in the back of New Scientist and applying for things, and I got a job got a job um, for a company that was doing medical animation, which was great fun. So you, you, you'd meet a client and they say, well, we, we've got a drug which works for Alzheimer's disease. Um, can we have a 15 minute animated video that shows uh, what goes wrong with Alzheimer's disease and plaques and tangles, and here's our drug which, which does this, and, uh, you know, dramatize it. So that was good fun. And um, I, I learned a lot about storytelling. I, I mean that in a, in a serious way. It's, it's kind of, how do, you, how do you find the right words? How do you tell a story in a straight line? How do you miss out stuff that's not relevant? How do you try and communicate with an international English audience rather than try and write <laughs> Has unnecessarily that, complex prose has that part of the process been hard because uh, I, I I don't know I, I've been watching a lot of your uh, of, of your lectures and, and and reading this book and there's a lot of really uh, interesting stuff in there about the the origins of life that maybe are not that easily translatable to the general public uh, how, how do you yes. deal with that uh, with a lot of anguish actually <laughs> I, I mean I don't know that I write, I don't know if I write well for the general public or not. I mean, the thing is for me, I'm interested in the science. Yeah. I'm interested in the ideas. I'm interested in not in dumbing it down, but in trying to make it clear. And I'm kind of aware that that means for the general reader who's not a scientist, they're going to find it hard work. Uh, but I hope that but the rewarding work. The, the, the ideas are just so intrinsically interesting that if you are interested in it, then, then it's, it's worth It's worth, uh, and then you really want to try and keep people's interest alive and make it clear and make it as plain as as I can. Anyway, just just to finish the story from from before, okay. how do you end up from medical research and writing videos for Alzheimer's disease? Basically, a lot of it was to do with oxygen and free radicals and mitochondria. It, it, this was in the 90s, and it seemed to be seemed to be underpinning almost every disease that I didn't know how to spell in the morning and in the afternoon I was supposed to be writing about it and by the evening I felt as if I was almost an expert because it was more free radical biochemistry. Yeah, and half these diseases like are not really free radical biochemistry but that's how it felt. So, um, but it's very frustrating. I came to the point where, you know, the client says hop so I hop and I don't, it's back to people telling me what to do again and I don't like that. Yeah. So. Uh, I started thinking, well, there's a, there, there is a book here. Why is it that all these diseases seem to be involving free radicals? Um, and that was the book that turned into oxygen. It took a long time to get a contract. Uh, and, and, and then when I started writing, well, I thought I have to say where the oxygen came from and how, how it collected in the atmosphere in an introductory chapter or two. And I lost myself in the geological literature. It's just so interesting. And I, uh, I, I again, I, I because I'd done all this writing about diseases I knew nothing about and, and wrestled with the literature quite quickly. I dived into the geological literature and found it really fascinating, and I was delighted to find that I could understand it. Um, and and so the book was really more than half of it was about the geological history of the Earth uh, and was completely new to me. And I think it carried a freshness with it for that reason. Yeah. That um, it was one of the reasons it, it did well. Or did you know well in inverted commas? It's, it's it, none of my books are big sellers. Yeah, it should be. So, so I have a question with respect to that. Would you say that writing a book for you is like a journey to learn something for yourself? Like, would you say absolutely? Yes, right. it's always hard to know who you're writing for. Um, you know, who, who actually wants to read this? I, I just don't know. And then you think, well, where are they anyway when they're reading it? Are, are they on the on the 
bus, on the tube? Are they in bed? Uh, are they reading for five minutes now and then falling asleep and then need to have their memory refreshed the next time they pick the book up? So how often do you repeat yourself? And in the end, I thought, well, I'm kind of writing for myself at the age of 16 when I didn't know very much, but I was really passionate about biology and evolution and chemistry, and, you know, so <laughs> I, I don't know who I'm writing for, really, but it's it, I, I'm really just trying to understand it myself. Yeah, I think it's a good approach because, yeah, for example, the vital question, I think it's, I mean, I'm a biologist, it's super understandable to me, but also, um, it's not super technical, maybe you have to Google a couple of things, but in general, I think uh, you do an amazing job uh, explaining the... Well, the thank you. I mean, I think for scientists or for biologists, it's not very difficult, but it, it can often be unexpected just because the canvas is, is big. Yeah. Um, but for, for, for non-scientists, I, I think it, it, it is difficult. Yeah. Um, it, it is a little bit as, as yeah. you described it, like uh, it, it's a bit hard work, but rewarding work. The, because the, like you said, the, the subject is intrinsically so interesting. Like one of the things you mentioned about the, the book uh, being about the geological history of, of, of the planet, I, I didn't I didn't know that before the how how closely linked uh, the the geology and uh, and and biochemistry were uh, in the origin of life like uh, you you would always uh, like read in the in the in the high school textbook like yeah this was the earth and this was like the scenario where everything happened but then this is what happened and then one thing that i noticed about your book is that the line between biology and geology kind of blurs a bit becomes a bit like a great yes i mean i think this is a problem that i have with the way the way things are taught partly this this idea that you know people would almost believe that the primordial soup existed that it's true that we really know that that, that um, primordial chemistry starts with cyanide that it makes build nucleotides this way um, it's almost as as if textbooks are gospel and that they're yeah. necessarily correct and I, I, I have I have a, a general problem with this in terms of society at the moment because scientists are having a bad time with COVID and with with you know, post truth and whatever else and and it's very hard in a way for scientists to argue publicly between themselves and and also arguments can be quite nasty sometimes and people I, 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 it can be very difficult but uh, at the same time. Science is all about argument, it, and, and it should be civilized argument, and it should be debate and discussion, and people should treat each other with respect. But but there are different points of view, and, and there's too much too much of that doesn't get through to the general public. And again, I try and I don't make a theme of it in my books, but I try to convey the idea that we don't know what the answers are, but here are some really interesting ideas, and I personally like these ideas for these reasons. But you know, you have to mention that there are other ways of seeing the question. Yeah, so I think maybe that's another thing that I, I, I try to get across and I, I'd like to think helps people. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting part when you're going through like the history of the various hypotheses we've had on the origins of life that, uh, that like you're saying, it's not gospel. It's like it feels like a dialogue between peoples across times and spaces uh, where they are uh, going through the evidence and through and through. Uh, experimentation to try to figure out uh, uh, this question. Uh, and dialogue's a very nice word. I mean, I feel very close to people who are dead <laughs> long yeah. ago when they were wrestling with the same questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you could take us a little bit through the history of the question itself. Like, uh, how, what, how has the human thought on how life started evolved over time? <laughs> Um, well, I suppose the usual starting place would probably be Darwin um, with his warm pond in this. It was just to throw away lines to a hooker in a, in, in a letter. Um, and, you know, that's still current. A lot of a lot of chemists working on the origin of life now will put that quote up on a slide at the beginning of their talk and say, I'm talking about Darwin's warm pond. And the modern term would be terrestrial geothermal systems. But, you know, it's essentially uh, it, it's to my mind, a form of soup. Um, and 
And then soup is the big idea and has been the big idea going back to the 1950s to the Miller-Urey experiment, uh, which was a breathtakingly good experiment. I mean, the idea that you could take the gases that you would see in the atmosphere of Jupiter and pass electrical discharges through it and get amino acids, which at the time, this was the same year as the double helix was published, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, the proteins were considered to be far more important than DNA at the time. And so these were the building blocks of life. Um, it was a fantastic experiment. It, it, it kind of put the origin of life on an experimental footing. Um, and it led to this idea, or it picked up on this idea of a primordial soup. Now that soup may be on land, in, in ponds, or it may be in the oceans, uh, but it's it's never gone away. I think it's a, a bad idea, the soup, um, but it's one that everyone's heard of. And I always ask my students when they come to UCL, you know, who's heard of primordial soup? And you know, they all have. Who's heard of hydrothermal vents, they've all heard of black smokers, but not so many of them have heard of the kind of vents, the alkaline hydrothermal vents that, that I talk about. So it's it's a meme, it's out there in society and everyone's heard of it. And, and, and it was a wonderfully good experiment. And I think it's a nice example of how um, really good scientific experiments can lead a whole field down what to me is the wrong avenue for, <laughs> for a long time. But a lot of the studies that have been done are nonetheless very very good studies that we've learned a lot from. It's really good chemistry that people have done. It just doesn't connect well with life. So there's there's all kinds of swirling issues about what's true and what's not true and what's a bit true. The other thing I've realized from all of this is the truth is usually somewhere in the middle and somewhere messy. Uh, but, but science tests hypotheses and the hypothesis needs to have an explicit statement of what you expect to find. And so it has to be kind of purist. So and that means I think emotionally people get attached to here, here are my ideas, here's the hypothesis, here's how I'm going to test it. And it, you know, 10 years later, you're still with that idea, still testing it. And, and you come to the point where you really don't want it to be wrong. Otherwise, I've just wasted 10 years and people get very attached to their hypothesis. And, you know, the truth is probably it's the only way to do science is to test hypotheses or this kind of science. But the answer's probably over there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. In that sense, I think your book is really unique because most of what you hear about in the Origins of Life community is like everybody's worried about these building blocks and how you assemble them and maybe the energetics that from the point of view of how do you make the reactions go forward so you can synthesize big polymers and then assemble them together. But I've, I've never heard before a perspective that was more concerned with what happens after that because you could easily synthesize the blocks or figure out a way of how you can get to those molecular constituents of the salts, but then what? Like, how do you get this going and pumping? And I think that's what's very yes. novel about your approach. I mean, I, at the start of lectures, I often show a picture of a dead whale on a beach, uh, which is intended slightly to shock, uh, but it, it's also because that is the perfect primordial soup. All the correct molecules are in exactly the right place. Um, it, it is all there, but it's dead and no one's going to bring it back to life again. So that's the problem with the soup in, in my mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not living. One of the things that uh, I really like about the book is that um, people try to figure out what the, the origins of life, just looking at the present, at, at how cells look right now. But I think telling the story and connecting the dots between what could have happened really, really helps to see the big picture. Like, so what's the most fundamental thing in uh, all life on Earth? Oh, so we all pump protons, right? We, we, we all produce ATP by pumping protons, so that that could have had an, a geological origin. Uh, I think that- Yes, that's I mean, that's, that's actually, those ideas uh, come um, from Mike Russell, who's actually at Caltech, uh, or at least JPL, but it's part of Caltech. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's been he's been pioneering those ideas for for a long. And I found them inspirational, uh, in part because I've got this background thinking about proton gradients across membranes and how on earth did that start? It's just so a mind-boggling question. Maybe we can describe this for the listeners that haven't read the book of like what's sure. the difference? What's what's your approach compared to the primordial soup? What what is the difference? Well, the the the, the difference is really structure. That you have structure from the beginning and you have flow across the structure. 
So this, this is language that any engineer would feel very comfortable with. Biochemical or chemical engineers are thinking in these terms all the time, that you, you, you've, you've got continuous flow, you've got continuous reactivity, and you have to set things up so, so that reactions are optimized. Um, this is not the language that most biochemists or molecular biologists are comfortable with because they are thinking far more about the structure of proteins or the structure of physical signaling systems or whatever it may be. And, th and there's a kind of a, a strange lifelessness to looking only at the structure. They, the flow is missing. Uh, and and, and what, one thing which is quite abstract about us is we look like physical objects. We don't appear, you know, we move, but we don't appear to be flowing. But we are flowing in the same sense in, in that um, we need to be breathing continuously. We need to be eating regularly. Uh, uh, and in the, in, in the mitochondria in our cells, we're, we're burning food in oxygen continuously to provide the energy to do absolutely everything. So everything we do is sustained by a continuous chemical reaction. And you'd never notice it. You, you kind of don't know. Only if you put a plastic bag over your head and you start suffocating, do you realize that I, <laughs> that I need this chemical reaction to keep me alive. And it's, you know, how does that kind of thing start? Well, well, you start thinking about hydrothermal vents. So what you have in a hydrothermal vent, which everybody can picture in their head of stuff coming, coming out of a vent, um, is continuous flow. It's a continuous reaction. Now, the problem for me with a soup is everything just sits there and nothing really moves and nothing really changes and you know things that can react have reacted already <laughs> mm. um so so what animates it and, and you can try and animate it with lightning or uv radiation or something but somehow it doesn't you know it's not as if you've got a continuous flow going through where a small proportion reacts and, and the rest leaves so it's a very very different system and it's quite an abstract comparison I, I struggle to put this in words in my books, uh, but the the idea that, that continuous flow is really fundamental to life and it requires a structure. So a cell has a membrane and the flow is across the membrane. So again, you can think of a plastic bag. The, the really reactive part of the bag is not the stuff that's inside the bag. It's the, it's the, it's the plastic bag itself where the, the reactions are all happening. So it's those two things. They're quite simple ideas that, that you, you soon get into a lot of complexity about chemiosmotic coupling and things. But it, it's it's basically the inside of the bag is different to the outside of the bag, mm -hmm. and, and you've got to keep it that way. <laughs> I, I like the way you put in the book of vectorial chemistry, like where actually the direction of how things uh, take place is, is very important for for living systems. It's not as you say the soup. So could, I guess could you describe for us like a how is it that cells get energy? Like maybe people haven't heard about the electron transport chain. So is there an intuitive way to think about how cells gather energy? Yes. I mean, the way our cells do it is very complex and it's inside the, inside the mitochondria. Um, and what they're doing really is stripping electrons from food and passing them down a wire inside the membrane to oxygen. And the, the current of electrons inside the membrane to oxygen is, is driving, pumping, the protons are pumping, sorry, the proteins are pumping protons, <laughs> I always struggle to say that, outside. So that sounds quite technical. A proton is the, the charged nucleus of a hydrogen atom. It's, it's about the simplest kind of non-fundamental particle that, that, that there is. Um, you pump it outside and what's just gone outside is a, is a positive charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you end up with is the outside being positive relative to the inside. And that charge is in the region of 150 millivolts, so 0.15 volts, which is not much, but it's over a really small distance. So if you work out, if you were to shrink yourself down to the size of a molecule and, 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 and work out what's the electrical uh, force that you would be subjected to, it, it's about equivalent to... 30, 000, 30 million volts per meter, uh, so like a bolt of lightning. So it's a really, really intense electrical charge on this membrane. So that's how we're powered. Hmm. We're powered by electrical flow, uh, an electrical current from food to oxygen, which is putting an electrical charge on a membrane, and that electrical charge on the membrane is driving absolutely everything. And that's my attempt to kind of take out the details and just concentrate on what are the really key things there. And then you can take that idea, you've got a 
a barrier with an electrical charge on it. And, and now we're in a geological environment. You have a different kind of a barrier with an electrical charge on it. Does it do the same thing? What do you want it to do? Mm -hmm. um, and I got lost here for a long time because what I wanted it to do was the same thing that it does in our cells. I wanted it to make ATP, which is normally called the energy currency of cells. Uh, and this is another thing where you, you realize, I realize that you bring a baggage with you, that you, you see a problem in a particular way and you think that's what's the important thing about it. And it's taken me a long time to realize that that's misleading, that the ATP synthase is this astonishing nanomotor which, which, which sits in the membrane and is, is driven by the electrical charge, in effect. Um, and it generates this energy currency called ATP, which is, I like to think of like a coin that you put in a slot machine, a protein is like a slot machine, you put the coin in and it goes drunk, drunk and <laughs> does its thing. And then you put another coin in and it keeps on doing that. Um, the real thing about the, the electrical charge on the membrane, why is it there? Why is it important? I think it's actually about driving growth in the very first place, because growth is how do you make hydrogen react with CO2 to make organic molecules, any kind of organic molecule. And if, it, if you've got hydrogen bubbling out of a vent, CO2 in the oceans, these kind of electrically charged catalytic surfaces with the same structure, what do you want it to do for you? You want it to make hydrogen react with CO2 to make organic molecules. And, and then you've got, a, you, you've got not living things, but growing things. And you're, you're, you're on the way then. So ATP is later and is not less important. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, and this is related to, I think, the opening statement maybe of your book where you say this very remarkable sentence that there seems to be a black hole uh, at the center of the biology or, or the origins of life field. So we can imagine these bioenergetics taking place, but uh maybe you can explain us better what what this black hole is well the black hole was actually something different to that it, it's um the, the black hole specifically was was about the origin of complex life rather than the, the simplest bacteria okay. um and, and the issue there is a very interesting one as well um which is that bacteria and archaea which uh, look quite similar down a microscope um have been around for four billion years, have a tremendous genetic variation. They've adapted to every imaginable environment. Uh, at, the, at the molecular level, they're incredibly complicated with all kinds of molecular machines and so on. Um, and, and yet they remain small and down a microscope simple. And then all complex life that we know about on Earth, complex in a morphologically complex sense, so you know, us, animals, plants, um, uh, and fungi, and even at the cellular level, things like an amoeba is, is about a hundred thousand times larger than a bacterium, so by volume. So there's just an enormous gulf in complexity between the simplest eukaryotes, not the simplest, but a standard, a standard eukaryote, and the most most complex bacteria. And that's the black hole, really, to me, at the heart of biology, which I was starting at, at that book. That why what is what is preventing bacteria from becoming more complex? Why can't we see a human being made of bacterial cells with a genome on the same size as a, as a, as a human genome? And you can't say that they just didn't search enough genetic sequence space because they've searched a lot more genetic sequence space than eukaryotes did. And they've searched a lot of the same sequence space as well because they've got the same genes, they, they've done the same things. So something is keeping them small and simple. And, and, and the obvious thing is its structure, that the, the difference between one of our cells, a eukaryotic cell, is we do all, all our energy generation inside the cell, inside mitochondria, which were bacteria once. So they were engulfed by a host cell. And all this electrical charge that I've been talking about, like, like a bolt of lightning on, 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 the, on the bacterial membrane, is now inside and you need genes to control that. Mm -hmm. We don't exactly know why you need genes to control that, but no, no complex cell has ever lost all its genes and remained as a complex cell. 
Uh, I'm sorry, Nick. Let me just emphasize this yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah. This is something that happened just once, right? Like yes. in the whole history of of life on the planet, the this whole uh, uh, would you call it an endosymbiosis? The the moment where yes. exactly. yeah, where, where so, so, one thing you, ate the other thing, and then they started like, uh, what would you call it? Is it a, a collaboration? Uh, I don't think we know. I think a collaboration is a good word. Yes. Um, I mean, in effect, two cells are snuggling up to each other to the point that one engulfs the other one, but they retain their individual identities and they trade goods. Um, they, they trade substrates or waste products or whatever it may be. Um, it's an exchange of goods going on. And, and almost by definition, they have to be different to each other to have things worth exchanging <laughs> with this, each other. Uh, this feels like a wonderful metaphor for something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How, do you, uh, how do you think about this endosymbiosis? Uh, did, is it more like a single event that happened once in the extreme case, or it was a constant process that was happening? In some... Well, I, I think a little bit of both. Um, the thing is that all, all eukaryotic cells, um, uh, the, the term eukaryote refers to cells with a nucleus, like our own cells. Um, but we, sh you know, you could have a textbook on the things that we have in common with a plant cell or with a fungal cell or something. There's just whole lists of things that we have in common. And what you understand from that is that we had a common ancestor, uh, which was maybe one and a half billion years ago. Uh, and you can try and work out in, in, in a tree of life, okay, so what do I actually share? What does one of my cells share with a plant cell or a mushroom cell? And the answer is virtually everything. At the level of cells, we all have a nucleus. We all have the same way of folding our DNA. We all have the same pores in the nuclear membrane. We all have the same membrane systems inside the cell. At, at, at that level of cells, we're almost identical, and most people couldn't tell the difference uh, if they looked down, down a microscope. Um, and so, by definition, there was a single origin of the eukaryotic cell. It's monophyletic, which is what the, the evolutionary biologists would say. So, so then one of two things is possible. Either it was really a rare event, or it's happened more than once, maybe thousands of times, maybe millions of times, but stuff just dies out and it never lasted and there's no, there's no record of it. Now, that's an assertion. And if it was true, well, if we search the world and find in, in all kinds of places, we find something really new, then that would disprove that idea that, that there was a singular origin. If we find complex cells that are obviously not eukaryotic, then that idea would fall flat on its face. But we haven't yet. And, and if you look in the fossil record and try and find things that we don't know what they are at all, there is stuff in the fossil record. We don't know what it is, but usually... Um, acritox and things, which are, I mean, they, they mean, I think the word means we don't know what it is, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, mm. But but most people seem to think, well, they're bits of stuff gummed up together and it's really not, not necessarily a, a, an entity as such. So, so to a first approximation, it, it's just as good an argument to say it only happened once as it is to say, well, it happened thousands of times and, and the evidence for it has disappeared thousands of times. Yeah. So, so then you can turn the question on its head and say, well, is there any good reason why it would have only happened once? And actually then you think, well, yes, there, there, there are, because bacteria and archaea have stayed the same for billions of years. So something is stopping them becoming more complex. So what's stopping them becoming more complex? Well, an endosymbiosis. One cell gets inside another cell, uh, and, and, and that allows you to effectively charge up the cell a great deal more and expand its, its nucleus to have many more genes, and then, you, then it can become complex. So how common is it for one cell to get inside another cell? With large complex cells, it's really common. With our own eukaryotic cells, there's hundreds of examples. But with bacteria, which are tiny and have a cell wall and are pretty rigid, it's really unusual. And once they've got in, well, they're not used to having things inside them and, and the things inside have got their own agenda and there's a kind of a battle going on. Um, mm. And the chances are that's going to go wrong as well and they'll just go extinct. Mm. So, so actually this way you have an explanation for why it's rare 
an explanation for why bacteria stay simple and an explanation for why eukaryotes became really complex and nothing else did. So it may not be true, but it's got a lot of explanatory power. Yeah. So it, is that a prediction of, uh, you know, we, la we just la launched uh, Mars 2020 and we're looking for life on Mars or other planets. Does that mean that, I guess, comes back to Fermi's paradox, like we, we don't expect uh, complex life to be that common if life is, if were to be a very common thing of just geochemical process of different planets, most likely it's going to be bacteria-like? Well, if, if those ideas are correct, then I would, I would favor the idea that the origin of life is not necessarily very difficult. Mm. Um, and the bacteri bacterial level of complexity will emerge on any wet, rocky planet. Maybe not any, but, but why not a tenth of them? I would expect it to be, I would hope that we would find something on Enceladus, on Europa, on Mars. I don't know, maybe not all of them, but, but one of them. I would be surprised if we found something on Venus, but that would be a good surprise. So, um, because it's not a wet, rocky planet in the same way. So, so, so it would be quite a different life form, the kind of life, I, you know, I'm thinking about life on Earth and I'm thinking what principles can we extract from life on Earth and extrapolate to somewhere else? Uh, mm -hmm. And, and the, I think there's some quite strong principles and those principles say life should start readily on a wet, rocky planet, but getting to complex life is quite difficult and requires something which happened once here. Maybe it could happen multiple times. Maybe it doesn't happen at all. It's not something which is inevitable. This, this sounds like amazing news in terms of the Fermi paradox, you know, because uh, we often talk about the big filter as being, you know, when society gets complex enough, it has the power to blow itself. Uh, but, but maybe it's not that. Maybe, maybe it's just it's hard for life to evolve complexity. I think it is hard for life to evolve complexity, but even when you've got complexity, uh, it's pretty rare to evolve a, a kind of level of complexity equivalent to a human society. I mean, if you just go back five million years, uh, we wouldn't really be holding a conversation with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so. Have you, uh, have anyone um, told you that, I mean, this, this argument of the, you need a rocky planet to start like a gradient of, of, of presence of powers left is really, really powerful. And in the book, you mentioned that uh, whenever life is present, we need that. Um, have has anyone criticized that, saying that it's like a geocentric um, argument? Or uh, yes, I, to to that? yes. I, I don't think it's being criticized in itself as an idea. Um, I, I've been accused of being Earth centric. <laughs> uh, and I don't think that I'm particularly Earth centric because I think there's lots of wet, rocky planets which are equivalent to Earth. But I, I, I would accept if someone said that, well, I, I lack imagination and I can only imagine life as it is on Earth. Um, I think, though, and that's true. You know, I, I, when I was about 16, I read Fred Hoyle's book, uh, The Black Cloud, which is a, a, about a, a kind of co um, co cosmic scale intelligence. And there have been some you know, really interesting writings about is that possible or not? How long does it take to communicate across a solar system sized black cloud? It takes you know, 15 minutes to send a signal from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. So it has to be a slow thinker at least. This, <laughs> does that matter? Uh, so that, you know, there are all kinds of interesting ways that people can imagine life could be. Um, but they haven't really thought through, well, what does it take to come up with a black cloud in the first place. I mean, it takes natural selection, I would say, as a biologist, it requires a population of black clouds and it requires selection within that population. And, and immediately it begins to look a lot less believable as an idea. It doesn't rule it out, I suppose, but it, it just begins to evaporate. And, and then you think, well, what do you need for life to start? Does it need to be carbon-based? And it doesn't necessarily need to be carbon-based, but but carbon is really abundant and it's really good at complex chemistry and it's much better at it than anything else, than like silicon or, or, or anything. Um, and it comes in a handy Lego brick, which is CO2, which you can take a, a brick and you build with bricks. Whereas if it's silicates, you're building with sand and you know, it's just an enormous molecule. It doesn't work. So, so there's a lot of good reasons why life 
is carbon based. And, and, and to, to make an organic molecule, to make anything complex, you, you start with CO2. You need hydrogen then because you've got an organic molecule is by definition, it's got hydrogen on it. So um, you, where's the hydrogen coming from? Well, it's coming out of this kind of hydrothermal vents that I talk about, which are produced from water reacting with rock. So a wet, rocky planet gives you the vent systems that you need. The CO2 is plentiful. And, and, and so you end up thinking, well, probabilistically, if you were to find a thousand life forms in, 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 in the galaxy, chances are 995 of them would be, would be carbon based and would work this way because it's just the easiest way to do it. So maybe it's not the only way to do it, but it's a lot easier than anything else I can think of. Maybe I'm just limited in my imagination. But on the other hand, maybe the people who say, oh, you're, you, 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 you're, you're too, you lack imagination. Well, maybe they lack some rigor of following their ideas through to see where do they lead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so that brings me to a question that's super, super interesting. Assuming that life, you know, were to be very common, maybe simple life, uh, it's, uh, as you said, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of planets in this galaxy have uh, microbes, maybe. I think it was Ernst Mayer who said that we could never reduce biology to just the fundamental physics and chemistry because there's some teleology, there's some purpose that life serves. Uh, but if it's just, you know, commonly happening, what is it that makes life appear like if it can appear what is driving it why is it life why do we have life if it's because life i mean i'm just i don't know if i'm being clear with my question but it just seems that we have a purpose no we want to survive we want to reproduce and if you see a you know a glass of water it doesn't want to do anything so we have some some purpose yes, in our existence. we like to think we have purpose don't we um <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> And, and, and I think a lot of people have a lot of anguish about what is this purpose that we have here. And we look at the state of the planet and we look what we're doing to things and we look at how we argue with each other. And we think, what, what is the purpose and how, how do we make things better for people? Um, and, you know, the, traditionally God did it um, and, and, and supplied a morality. But again, to me, that feels shallow. It's not really a purpose. What do I want to do? Go to heaven and then spend the rest of eternity. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> Playing the harp, the maybe. That? I, I, you know, maybe again, I'm just limited, but I don't see the purpose there either. In the end, I come back around to society and think the only purpose that we can make for ourselves is 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 to be decent human beings in a society that it's it's amazing that we're here at all um and and we can make our own meaning so i don't know how popular that idea is i doubt that it's likely to make a lot of people very happy but i, I think a lot of <laughs> philosophers have also seen meaning within society but again societies die too and and there isn't really any eternal meaning there at all so why do we have this feeling that we, there should be purpose and there should be meaning? Well, because we have needs, I suppose, as organisms. And, and, and that, in the end, comes from just being alive, from needing to grow, from the... It's... it's uh, I, I guess... I guess that's, you know, that's I, a long way around to say I'm not sure there is any meaning. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would say I was just playing David's devil's advocate because I really think of life as being like a consequence of the loss of physics, like a natural way to dissipate energy gradients, just another... Yes. Which is rather a noble way of seeing it, I think, actually. That yeah. A, that, that a universe, that a planet, that an active system w would give rise to life as a natural outcome of, of uh, the laws of physics. I, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a beguiling idea. Um, I'm not sure it's entirely true either in what I was saying about complex cells, eukaryotic cells. That's, I don't think, the outcome of a law of physics. There's something much more freaky about that event. But the idea that the, the, the planetary systems will naturally give rise to life, which will naturally end up giving rise to consciousness, which will naturally, uh, you know, this is an idea that a lot of physicists like. Um, and it's very appealing. I, I'm just not sure that it's true all the way through, but it's an appealing idea. Uh, uh, on this issue, I'm afraid I, I have to side with you, Nick, in the <laughs> in the sense that, uh, yeah, we humans like to think we have uh, we have a purpose and and 
but but maybe the the whole concept of purpose is just a, a human conception of of reality itself. Maybe maybe life just is, and uh, and we're just like working around it, trying to make sense of it. Yes, I, I think it just is, and it's beautiful. Um, and and you know, I can find purpose in my life. I I would like to know how things happened, how things came about. I'm I, part of society. I would like other people to to know. I would like to be part of a part of a society that makes progress with these things. I would like to enjoy music, enjoy these discussions, enjoy arts, to be part of a society. Uh, and, and I find enough purpose in that. Now, it's not real purpose in the sense that it, it will die with me. It will, you know, my kids will die, you know, but, but it's, <laughs> it's a glorious thing. You know, if, it, if in the end it's empty of real meaning and yet it's so glorious that we can do great things, um, then it's worth fighting for. It's worth trying to stop the world going to hell in a handcart the way it's going at the moment to, to fight for something better because that has some meaning. So I think we, we, we make up our own meaning and it's, it's linked to society. It's not linked to some, some, something to do with God, in my view. It's linked to us. Uh, Nick, I, I, I always make this, uh, the, 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 this question uh, to... To, to every biologist I, I know, and I have to apologize in advance, but uh, uh, when I first learned about the the Gaia hypothesis, I, I, I was like awestruck. Uh, I, 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 I just, uh, it just changed my, my worldview. Like, like I couldn't conceive another way of, of, of viewing it. Uh, what's, what's your take on it? Do you, uh, Do you see it as a as a whole self-regulating process, uh, with, or, or or how could something like that emerge from from hydro hydrothermal vents? <laughs> um, I, I, I think Gaia is a beautiful conception. Um, I, I think it was intended as a metaphor in the first place. And I think that um, James Lovelock probably was surprised at how many biologists reacted badly yeah. to his vision. Um, and I, it was partly, I think, self-inflicted because I think he tried to claim too much. Uh, and again, the evolutionary biologist jumped up and down and said, well, you can't have an organism with this level of complexity that you're ascribing to it unless it's been selected and it's part of a population. And so we're, we're back around to what I was saying about, about black clouds. So it's, it's not, as he originally said, um, an organism in its own right. But the idea that it's self-regulating, the idea that it's a system, the idea of all this interlocking, well, I, I think that was less clear before, he, before the Gaia hypothesis. And now it would be called Earth System Science, and it's basically main, mainstream, um, not using the words that Lovelock necessarily used. And, and he's a very clever man. Um, I've met him once or twice. He's he's very sharp, intelligent, good inventor as well. I mean, one of one of the most smart people I've met. So I think he's not right about everything. No, nobody is. But but I, I think the idea is a really valuable idea and a beautiful idea. And 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 there's a lot of truth in it, though it's not it's, it's not true as he'd originally expounded it in, in in my book. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, a lot. Uh, because I, I I don't know in this in this uh, uh, worldview of, of maybe maybe humans of a, as a uh, as as a single po population don't re maybe not even humans maybe maybe individuals don't have like like you know a single purpose but but maybe it's 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 just a tiny a tiny a tiny perspective of the of the whole thing. Uh, uh, of yes, I mean, by that view, our purpose is to destroy the planet the way things are going. At the <laughs> <moment>. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, I would say, you know, I've never, I never heard about the concept of geobiology with Dan which Daniela works on, but mm -hmm. just going to hikes and she explaining, you know, this is of organic uh origins and these rock formations, you can see sediments and shells, materials yeah. like the. It's just that I guess we're not used to in biology. We think about evolution, but it's like uh, which is a long scale, uh, long time scale thing. But just the constant exchange. We always say, you know, the environment imposes selection yes. on the organisms. 
but there's some feedback that the organisms actually modify the environment over geological time, allowing and I think, new niches yeah. to be occupied and created. I think Lovelock's major contribution was probably exactly that, was this, the strength at which organisms feed back uh, and change the environment and keep it, I wouldn't say constant because it's changing all the time, but, but keep it within, within bounds and modify it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. The idea I understand originally came from thinking about life on Mars uh, because NASA tasked him with um, trying to come up with a, a, a way of measuring whether or not there's life on Mars. And he thought about it and said, well, we don't need to go to Mars to do that. Um, what the sign of life on Mars would be a, an atmosphere that's out of equilibrium, where you would have methane and oxygen coexisting in the same atmosphere. Over And, and this is what's just come up with, with, uh, with Venus and phosphine gas, the idea that it shouldn't be there. And if it is there, it's being replenished continuously. Um, and so it's out of equilibrium. And that's that was Lovelock's suggestion that here's how we know if there's life on Mars. And his answer was, no, there isn't, because there is no disequilibrium that we can measure from here spectroscopically. Uh, so so no need to send a rocket, guys. So they sacked him, I think, at that point. <laughs> do, do you know why, why do you think they uh, say that these gases of, of in Venus phosphines, uh, why they are necessarily produced by living systems? Well, they're not necessarily produced by living systems. Uh, they're produced abiotically as well, mm. um, but not in the kind of levels that they appear to be in the atmosphere of Venus. Mm. So it may be that there are abiotic mechanisms that we don't know about, or it may be that their estimates are wrong by orders of magnitude, which I suspect is the case. Mm. Um, but you, you have to also entertain the possibility that, well, on Earth, I think half the phosphine that's produced is 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 produced by um, by us, and and most of the other half is produced by life methanogens in in in, in bogs and things like that, um, and, and so a small contribution on Earth is coming from purely abiotic mechanisms, and if that were true on Venus as well, then that doesn't explain why there's so much phosphine in the atmosphere. So it's either life, as we don't know it, or <laughs> There's some fancy abiotic way of generating lots of phosphine in a place which is normally extremely oxidizing and it should have just been disappearing immediately. So it's genuinely intriguing. Yeah. I would like to come back a little bit to the yeah. idea of complex life. Um, so I recently learned that uh, I didn't know that in the uh, Cambrian explosion, uh, basically all 30 phylum of animal groups were already exists like all the body plants were already there and there's basically been quote-unquote little innovation since then uh, and it seems uh, at least my understanding uh, and you can correct me if this is not true it seems that innovation in 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 life becomes it's like a bursty process sometimes you get a lot of innovation and then you just like slightly tune and tweak the, the things that you get then there's another wave of innovation and then you start modifying it again so is there's like why is the, if that's true, why is that? Do you have any idea of why do we have waves of innovation? Um, yes, I, I think for the most part, natural selection is pretty conservative and eliminates change. So it's purifying selection is, is, is preventing anything from, from becoming less well adapted to an unchanging environment. So you get change when the environment changes and then things adapt to that. And for most things, most of the time, the environment changes in quite subtle ways, quite slowly. And so change is slow or virtually non-existent. Um, something like the Cambrian explosion, you're, the, the, there was a kind of a, an Earth system change. And exactly what it is, the geologists are still disputing. I think oxygen is probably a, a, a substantial part of it, but it certainly wasn't driving it. Uh, but but you cannot really have complex ecosystems with multiple trophic levels, so a, a food web, um, mm. in the absence of oxygen. There's just not enough energy in the system to have predators eating, other predators eating herbivores, which are eating the, the grass. You, you just can't have four trophic levels. Um, so I think that's what happens in the Cambrian explosion is really what you're looking at is lots of predators and prey. You're looking at complex ecosystems, uh, lots of shells and claws. And um, so 
why so many body parts? Well, a whole new world is opening up. There can be explosive change um, because you're radiating into a completely open, empty niche. Um, and, and there's very little constraint. Once you've got a developmental pathway, then it's harder to change that developmental pathway. And so the, the constraints come from development in itself. So I think, you know, the, 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 there was a, there's a lovely paper from years ago, and it's quite simple, about how long does it take to evolve an eye? Hmm. Uh, and it was a mathematical model and, and a relatively simple mathematical model. And it effectively just said, OK, you've got a, you've got a, a sheet and we've got a light sensitive spot in the middle of this sheet of tissue. Uh, how long will it take to go from there to evolving an eye? And so what do you do? Well, you make a slight dip in the sheet. And there's an advantage to that because then the light will cast a slight shadow. And so there is an advantage to having a slight dip in the sheet and that dip will get better as it as it gets deeper. Um, and you can effectively go through step by step, never changing but more the previous version by more than about 1% of how it was before, right the way through to an eye with a lens. And then you say, okay, how long... Uh, how, how much change can I allow? How long is a generation? Let's say a generation is one year in some small sea creature. Um, and that you allow 1% change each year in each of these structures as they're, as they're evolving. How long does it take to evolve an eye? And the answer is half a million years. Now, obviously, that's simplistic and that's not necessarily true. But most people would want to say tens of millions of years because it's really complicated. And it, it doesn't have to be. Hmm. I think there's a big confusion in, in biology. If you, if you look at, for example, the origin of photosynthesis, what's called oxygenic photosynthesis, the kind that plants do, and oxygen is the waste product. Um, how long does it take to evolve? If you look at molecular clocks, so you're looking at the change in, 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 um, in the gene sequences and you try to work out when, when did it arise, the answer would, is, is about six billion years ago, which is before the Earth was formed. <laughs> so then there's two, there's two possibilities. Either the clock's wrong or else life was seeded from outer space. And there's no evidence to suggest it was seeded from outer space and there's a lot of reasons to think the clock's wrong. So why would the clock be wrong well, the clock would be wrong because what you're normally measuring is is a very conservative process that virtually all mutations are eliminated because they're harmful. And, and so change happens really slowly. But that's not measuring a new adapt adaptation to a new environment, something like an eye or something like photosynthesis, where the rate of change could be much faster. And actually, at the moment, I don't think we know how much faster it could be. I just said an eye, half a million years, but that's just, you know, it, it, it's a model that may or may not be correct. All I'm trying to do is say it could be really fast. Similarly with photosynthesis, how fast could it be? Well, you can say if you allowed every single change, instead of being detrimental to be beneficial, how long would it take? <laughs> and I think I've not worked this out yet, but I suspect that the answer is a couple of million years. I don't think it would take very long. Yeah, it's really interesting. There, there's this guy, I like uh, Daniel Fisher at Stanford, and he has uh -huh. this quote that he says that, you know, let's imagine that geologists got it wrong again. And <laughs> the Earth is either 10 times younger or 10 times older than we originally thought. Will that affect uh, what we, like uh, our understanding of, of evolution? And he's like, we, are, we don't even know enough to know if a factor of 10 either way is significant. Because like... Well, uh, you know, the origin of the eukaryotic cell that we were talking about uh, earlier on, when did that happen? Um, there are some very good scientists who honestly think, sincerely think, and, and have some evidence to support the claim that it goes right back to the last universal common ancestor of life on Earth close to four billion years ago. There are some equally eminent scientists who would put a date of 850 million years on it. Most people would say around about one and a half to two billion years but effectively, we have we have we have a date of one and a half billion years ago with an error bar of about three billion years. We just don't know. <laughs> the, the idea is interesting because um, what speeds up the evolution of an eye, for example, is the available energy that you have. Right, you have an endosymbion that is producing a lot of ATP for you. Uh, I think in the in the in the we have a calculation. What what happens if you're an archaea? Uh, 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 archaeobacterial uh, host and you engulf a bacteria and this bacterial 
specializes in producing energy and loses just 5% of the genome. And turns out it's a lot of energy just to build, you know, cell cytoskeleton, for example. So like, um, it goes back to, it. at the beginning you were saying that um, you had trouble with people that wanted to tell you what to think and how to think about biology. I yes. think it happens a lot that when you learn biology, you learn, learn about the, the cell, right? The eukaryotic cell. It has, it's the nucleus, which is the central part, and then the organelles, mitochondria, uh, I don't know, Golgi, apparatus, blah, blah. But reading your book, I was think, really thinking, why don't we think about uh, eukaryotic cells as associations? Not as a unit necessarily, but as an association. Yeah. The evolution of this association has driven the evolution well, that of was, That was, you know, the, the co-pioneer of the Gaia hypothesis was Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and she really saw the world as associations and she saw eukaryotic cells in, in the serial endosymbiosis theory as associations. Now, I think she saw more associations than there really are, but nonetheless, she pioneered this whole conception that, 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 that life is a network, that, that, that things are, 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 you know, it's all symbiosis really to her. She, towards the end, maybe went a bit far with it, but the, the, you know, it was overturning the bandwagon of uh, everything is vertical inheritance and associations are trivial and, and it's all about me, me, me. So really she turned that over and she was a controversial character, but deserves a lot of credit for having, you know, put, put, put an idea out there that is not always associated with her, but it's one of the most important ideas in, 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 in 20th century science in my book. So maybe could you expand a little bit on why is it the case that complex organisms actually require these endosymbiosis and these uh, kind of mitochondria being the center, the energetic center of the cell? Uh, yes. So, so the the idea is quite simple, really. I mean, you could think of a of, of a mitochondria as a kind of battery pack, and you could say that it needs a control unit to function as a battery pack. Um, now. What you start out with is, is a population of bacteria living inside a cell. So they're all battery packs, but they've all got a massive control unit, which is the size of the bacterial genome. And it, it costs a lot to run that <laughs> control unit in itself. What happened over time is uh, the, 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 the complexity of the control unit was pared down and pared down until a little bit like what happens in the, at NASA where they're building a machine that starts out the size of a room and ends up packed up like this and goes on board a spaceship. Um, so, so, so this is what's happened with the bacteria. What you retain is multibacterial power, but without the overheads. And, and so e each, each mitochondrion produces just as much energy as a bacterium would. It's just that it doesn't have to express 3,000 genes. It's only got to express 38 genes. Uh, or, you know, it varies a little bit depending on which group you're in. Um, and so you, you've, you've, all those energy savings can, in principle, allow you to support a much more complex nuclear genome with lots of, lots of genes doing lots of different functions. Now, we also see some occasionally some giant bacteria. So the idea that you need a control unit in the battery in the first place is maybe controversial. But these giant bacteria, if you need a control unit and they become really big, then you say, well, you're going to have to have lots of control units, lots of genomes right next to the membrane. Otherwise, that idea is just not true. Uh, and it turns out they do. They've got tens of thousands of copies of their complete genome right next to the membrane, right where this hypothesis says that they should be. And if you try and work out, well, what does it, what's the energetic cost of having 20,000 copies of a genome or 200,000 copies of a genome, with 3,000 genes in the genome to make copies of the to, to make the proteins in all of those genomes, um, it costs a tremendous amount. So, so I like to think of it as uh, is symmetric that you've got a genome which controls a certain volume of of cell and a certain area of membrane around the cell. Um, and, 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 and giant bacteria, you could think of them as a consortium of identical things just glued together. And what's happened with, uh, with with eukaryotes is because there's an endosymbiosis, because the power packs have got inside, along with their control units. As you pare down the control unit, you can transfer stuff to the to the nucleus, which can become bigger. So the total 
amount of DNA, the total number of genes may be the same. It's just that it's now asymmetric. You have lots of tiny genomes supporting a massive nuclear genome, which now can code for almost anything. So it's that transition from, from going from a symmetry to a genomic asymmetry. Um, mm. and, and, and really, it's, it's, it's not saying the nucleus is not important. It's just saying that you can't have a nucleus unless you've got mitochondria and that you had to have um, the, the, the association between two different cell types that were, were snuggling up to each other because they were having a you know, symbiosis. Um, mm. As Lynn Margulis had, had argued, I would say that was a singular event. It's not something which happens all the time. Um, she would have said this does happen all the time. It happens in all kinds of different environments, and and and, and it's not a singular event. Um, but but it's you know either way we're talking about the importance of a symbiosis to changing the structure of cells, the structure of life, and the possibilities that can happen. So in the book you discuss a lot of about how once you open this Pandora box you have a opportunity to explore a lot of things and and what i really like is how this idea has explanatory power for a lot of things that we see in ourselves and in all complex life i don't know if you would like to tell us about let's say the origin of sex or 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 aging or what is it like mm -hmm. a, how is it like a single endosymbiotic event just change the world literally forever um it, it's a different starting point so instead of just starting with the population of cells and then you think, well, you know, if it, it, there's a problem here that if sex is an advantage to a cell, you know, I'm just th think about a population of bacterial cells. If, it, if it's an advantage to, to make gametes like sperm and eggs or but tiny ones and, and that they fuse together to generate a new bacterium, well, that's what all eukaryotic cells do, but no bacteria do that. Um, they do exchange genes, and sometimes it's called bacterial sex, but that's quite misleading because it's nothing like eukaryotic sex. So, so why don't they? If it's an advantage in one population, why is it not an advantage in another population? So, so the eye is another nice example of that, that um, there have been at least 60 or 70 separate uh, independent origins of eyes, they're not completely independent in the sense that um, most of these are in metazoans, and so they share a common ancestor that was a light-sensitive spot. There are protists that have eye spots and things as well. So, so there are there are things like camera eyes in single-celled organisms, but but most mostly they're in animals. And in animals, they share a common ancestor, but the common ancestor had no complexity at all. There were some regulatory genes it had, which are still conserved which means an octopus eye and a human eye evolved completely independently uh, from, from a light sensitive spot. And the fact that they're both camera type eyes with a lens and so on, but they're rewired, they're wired upside down relative to each other is, you know, it's a, it's a, a nice proof that you can keep on evolving the same thing in different environments because of convergent evolution. Now you'd apply, I would apply the same principle to sex or to having a nucleus or to doing phagocytosis or any of these complex eukaryotic traits, um, that if it's an advantage, you would expect to see some bacteria doing it, that this one should have become large and phagocytic, and this one should have got a nucleus where it stores its DNA in pretty much the same way, and this one should go through a sex cycle, maybe not exactly meiosis, but something that looks a bit like meiosis. But we never see that in bacteria, so why not? Well, the simple thing is to say, well, they're, they're, they're not adapting to an external environment. They're adapting to an internal environment. They're adapting to their own symbionts. You've got a conflict going on between the, 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 the mitochondria inside, the bacteria that became mitochondria, and the host cell. Now, then you can say, okay, well, why would that lead to a nucleus or to sex or something? And, and, and the great thing here is you can almost you've got a completely wide open playing field. You can <laughs> dream up anything you want and then try and test it because very, very few people anywhere in the world are starting. They say, okay, we've got a simple archaeal cell. In recent years, probably something to do with the Loki archaeota or the Asgard superphylum. These are, these are now known to be quite closely related to the host cell that acquired mitochondria. 
they have nothing inside them. They're, they're, they're really simple cells um, in terms of morphology. Give them an endosymbiont. What would you expect to see? Some kind of conflict going on. Well, let's think through what would happen. You can think about why are there two sexes? Why is the sex? Why is there a nucleus? And, you know, I don't know if the ideas are right. I'd like to think they are, but it's just an, a different starting point that says you're going to have to have a relationship between these two cells that get along and resolve their differences. So it's really about how do you resolve the, the, the conflicts in a way which is successful. And, and uh, yeah, why, why, why would they have sex at all? Well, it's partly that as soon as you've got this energy um, generators in mitochondria, you can have a much larger nuclear genome. And as soon as you have a much larger nuclear genome, you've got a problem with mutations accumulating. And what sex really does is, is, um, is, is, is prevent mutation accumulation. So this is what it's known to do well. Lateral gene transfer in bacteria can do that as well in principle. And in practice, we've just, uh, I've had a, a PhD student who's just published a paper a couple of weeks ago showing that um, it only works if you've got chromosome sized chunks of DNA. It doesn't work if you take up a gene or two from the environment. You just have to pick up so many genes from the environment, and the chances of you getting the wrong one or the chances of it being mutated itself is so high that you can never fix your problems. You need a whole chromosome chunk which is now getting like sex. You, you line up chromosomes and you switch between them rather than throw it all away. And, and so it's all my, I mean, we finished that paper with the line sex was forced upon us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, so, so, someone emailed to, to not exactly complain, but they, they, they noticed, but you, you cannot have a large genome without having a mechanism like sex where you line up chromosomes and you do recombination between them. It just doesn't work with bacterial mechanisms. So bacteria never have the problem because they could never have a genome that big. So they never face the problem. Yeah. Uh, that is and so romantic to, to uh, the, the purpose of sex to be to, to avoid uh, mutations. But why too, though? <laughs> Uh, it, it seems like the world, the worst of two worlds, like, and not least specific, why two sexes? Well, one sex passes on mitochondria, so, so uh, females almost by definition pass on the mitochondria in the oocyte, and males don't pass on the mitochondria in the sperm. So the, the kind of the, the deep, deep difference between, it's not the X chromosome or the Y chromosome, that's just a mammalian thing and birds are different and, and, and uh, you know, beetles are different again and wasps are different. There's all these different mechanisms of determining sex. Um, but all animals have, the females produce oocytes and the males produce sperm. But you can go back even before that to look at protists, single cells things, and they also produce gametes, but they're not eggs and sperm. If you're, if you're a single-celled organism, then the investment in making an egg, which would be a lot bigger than you, is just crazy. <laughs> so they, they, they make motile gametes, which look a little bit like tiny sperm, and they're identical to each other. At least they look identical to each other. So they're called isogametes, and they both have the same number of mitochondria. They, you know, they, they look the same in every way. But one of them, when they, when they fuse together, Either the mitochondria will be excluded or they'll be broken down. I mean, basically, the, the, the difference between the sexes is that females pass on mitochondria and males don't. So why is that? Um, and, and it's partly, I think, simply that when you've got mitochondria, you've always, you've always got a population. You've always got, in an oocyte, 100,000 or 500,000 mitochondria, each with its own copy of DNA. But you're always dealing with 10 or 20 or 100 copies of, of DNA. And, and, and it's difficult then, how do you make sure your average stays high? If you accumulate a mutation, your average kind of quality has hardly changed. And you could accumulate a lot of mutations before you can measure a difference because you, know, you, can, you can have five mutations in, 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 in this but you've got another 100 copies and they don't have those mutations, so there's no noticeable difference. And you can have five different mutations in that one, and again, your average is okay, and, and, and gradually it, you, you become impaired, and eventually you go over a cliff. Um, so the question is, how do you um, select for the best mitochondria, given that you always have a population? And the simple answer to that is, well, you, you've got to take samples 
and you've got to make sure that this cell is different to that cell is different to this cell in its sample of mitochondria. So different uh, different different gametes have different mitochondria, and each one has a, a small small sample that um, you, you hope that they're all identical to each other. And then you can test drive and see if they work or not. And the ones that don't work die, and the ones that do work uh, go on to the next generation. So it's about how how do you select for quality when you're dealing with a population? <laughs> mm-hmm. And the uh, and the only way to do it is to sample, and that means immediately you can't have both parents passing on their mitochondria because then you you're getting mutations from both. And and even in the, the female germline goes through a lot of selection to make sure that each oocyte has basically identical mitochondria in in this uh, which will be different to that oocyte and different to this one so mm-hmm. it's 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 po- it's population control at the at the cellular level <laughs> there was a point in the book that i was uh reading uh, the origins of sex and death i was like wow my two favorite topics <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah it's it's amazing how death that the, the fact that we are programmed to die is deeply entangled with this idea of having two sexes. I was uh, c- c- can you explain a little bit why we are programmed to die and why uh, mitochondria has a place for role there? Yes, I mean that's uh, we're not exactly programmed to die, but cells are often programmed to die, um, and and cells in our bodies are programmed to die by what's called programmed cell death or apoptosis. Um, and you know it uses mitochondria again <laughs> they really are the, the heart of everything and, and again I, I try and take a step back and, and think well, wh- why are they at the heart of all of this <clears throat> and and it's partly that they are really integrating the, the system as a whole that you know if you if you are damaged and you can't process your food and you can't grow and you, or you can't repair yourself then then that damage is really most noticeable in the in the mitochondria and so which is to say you you're unable to produce enough atp or you're unable to produce enough of the uh, building blocks to to repair things to 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 recover so this goes if you had a viral infection it goes if you've got iron toxicity it goes if you're just getting older and you're accumulating mutations um and what happens then at that point is the mitochondria pull the plug um, and they they release the respiratory protein and other proteins as well. The cytochrome C is a, is actually involved in respiration into the cytoplasm, and that triggers triggers yeah. uh, immediate death. Yeah. And you see the same thing in in bacteria. Mm. So not this case with the mitochondria inside, but there's the the cell membrane around it, which has got this same charge on it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and and then the question is, well, you know, a bacterium is a single cell. Why would it do that? Why would it kill itself? And the answer is actually standard evolutionary biology, which is, well, it's 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 in a population and the population around it have got very similar genes. And let's say this bacterium um, gets infected by a virus. So what's going to happen next? Well, it's probably going to die. And not only is it going to die, it's going to make a million copies of this virus and it's going to infect all the other cells around it. So it has to make a decision. What am I going to do? And, and, and the best answer is, I'm going to kill myself. And I'm going to do it faster than this virus can make a million copies of itself and infect all my brothers and sisters out there. And then, and then the question is, well, how do I kill myself so quickly? And the answer is, you plug a hole in, in your membrane and you, you effectively you, 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 you collapse the membrane potentials. You co- collapse the electric charge on the membrane. And so this is the fastest and simplest thing you can do to kill yourself. And this is actually what's happening in apoptosis uh, in this program cell death in us. That's why I think the mitochondria are right at the heart of the system, because they're, they're kind of calling the shots and saying, me as a system, uh, I'm in trouble. It's not necessarily that my genes are bad. It's that I've just been infected by a virus or I've, I've got a deficiency of iron or whatever it is. I'm not going to survive. I'm going to pull the plug now. And my 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 um, you know genetic cousins will 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 um, benefit from me dying. Mm-hmm. So that's standard evolutionary biology, but it's very interesting that the mechanism is a mitochondrial mechanism. Yeah, because you also talk about aging, you know, about how mitochondria accumulate mutations, and that's sort of uh, what drives aging in us. Yes. So so aging is in part 
caused by uh, you know things like neuronal cell death and, and 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 cells killing themselves or failing to kill themselves as in cancer um where they're supposed to kill themselves but don't and again the mitochondria are essential to both processes so as you accumulate mutations in mitochondrial dna or differences with the nuclear background they still have to interact and talk with each other and if they don't talk well this mitonuclear uh, interactions then not only do you not produce enough ATP, but you don't produce enough um, new building blocks. They're all coming from the mitochondria as well. If you need new amino acids, you need new, new, new nucleotides, uh, new fatty acids. Um, so effectively what's happening with cancer is they're sabotaging the mitochondria to make more building blocks. They don't need the energy, they need the building blocks. And, and so, so, so they, they sabotage the mitochondria to do that. And one of the problems with aging is as these systems run down, um, signals go to the nucleus to say stress, stress state, switch these genes off, switch those genes on. And, 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 and you know, it's partly an epigenetic process in that sense, it's a program. Um, but it, energy levels and mitochondria are underpinning all of that. So how, what does the science say? How do I live forever by keeping my mitochondria happy? What do I have to do? I guess you say I should not take uh, antioxidants, right? I'm going to throw them away right now. I don't think they would help. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're going to live forever anytime soon. Um, I mean, there's some real optimism at the moment that maybe we can, uh, but I personally doubt it. Um, the thing is, life is immortal. Cells have produced clean copies of cells generation after generation going back to the origin of life and, and this flame of life if you like the the, the, the the mitochondria the electrical charge on the membranes um, which is driving everything has been passed on not in the genes not in the nuclear DNA but as a physical entity with a with a, an electrical charge on it right back to the origin of life that's an astonishing thing and To do that, you've got to have a mechanism of, of selection for the mitochondria that are capable of maintaining the right charge on their membrane and getting rid of the ones that, that, that don't and can't. Um, and the germline does that in multicellular organisms, and it does it by a tremendous amount of wastage uh, and selection and, and, and care. You know, so, so, so a baby well, an, an unborn female b baby would would have something in the order of seven million, if I remember rightly, primordial oocytes. Um, and they are pared down before birth to less than a million. So you're losing the, the, the great majority of them even before birth. And this whole thing appears to be a selective process to make sure that mitochondria are as functional as they can possibly be. Now, you transfer that into your brain or something and think, well, how, how can I have a system? I know roughly how it works in, in, in the female germline to produce clean copies of mitochondrial DNA. How am I going to do that in the brain? And the answer is, well, it must be extremely difficult to do that. Um, it'll take us a long time. I'm not sure it's possible. That, uh, that phrase gave me goosebumps. Life is immortal. Like, uh, maybe, don't, don't you feel our, our approach to the to the to the question of life is a bit too materialistic and individualistic because from that perspective, uh, uh, physical individuals of population seem like just the vehicle for this like process to, to keep happening. Um, well, that's probably true. Um, I don't think that makes us less as individuals though. Um, I think as well, though, we can be too much of individuals and too little as part of a society. So, uh, I, I mean, I think there's, you know, we've, we've had a long period in the West, at least, of, 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 of really thinking in a selfish, individualistic way. Uh, probably the apotheosis was Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing as society. Yes. <laughs> um, it, and, 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 you know, plainly, we're going to destroy the planet if we go on this way. And, and I'm reading a book at the moment uh, by Tim Jackson, um, 
called uh, Prosperity Without Growth, which was a classic book from a few years ago. But it's a very interesting read because, you know, plainly the, this drive to increase GDP and increase prosperity all the time doesn't make people happier. It doesn't make them, you know, being richer doesn't make them happier. It doesn't, it, society's not improved for most of these things. In, in developing societies which are very poor, then, then higher GDP and higher, higher, higher funding and so on is, is really important. But in most, you know, in, in America, in, in, in Europe, um, I'm, I'm sure in Mexico too, it's just this continuous drive towards growth isn't really doing anybody any good. Oh, Mexico has already what does, abandoned what does that. make people happy? You know, very often it's 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 social networks and it's it's being part of the fabric of society and so on, and it, it's 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 communal projects and those things do seem to make people feel happier in in their life. And you know, I, I, we've got to overcome this individualistic urge, this selfish urge for more for me, um, and 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 realize that we'll be happier if we you know consume less. That, that was my, my, my next question, like, uh, as a society, do you think it would be worth it to, to look at basic principles of life as a guideline to, uh, to, to build new, new, new ways of coexisting? Because uh, I am amazed at the, at the wording of, of, how, of, of how a single cell, uh, uh, as you said, it t takes the decision of killing itself. But, uh, m but it is a single cell. Like it, mm. maybe the decision isn't is is not driven in the same way we make decisions, you know, through reason and considering pros and cons. Maybe maybe mm. it is like a basic principle of life: uh, self sacrifice for the group. Would it be worth it as a society to look at this growth in complexity through collaboration uh, as a guideline for future endeavors? Uh, yes, I think so. But I, I think there's a dangerous precedent, really, of, of trying to moralize from biology, which, you know, this is where all they say fair economics comes from in the first place is yeah. really Darwinian nature read in tooth and claw idea. And I don't, you know, there's truth in that, but there's also truth in in um, in, in in networking in, in in nature as well. And there's, I, I I gave a talk a while ago where I was asked specifically to try and draw some morals from biology, um, and I, I ended up talking about um, the requirement for, for for eukaryotic cells having two partners who are very different to each other. <laughs> um, and, and the requirement for sex and the, the fact that sex uh, increases, in, in, in brings things together, um, joins things together, can accumulate genes, and so I, you know, I was just trying to put a, a different picture to the idea that that it's all about selfish conflicts. This it, it, biology can be, but it's not only about that. And there are there are much nicer morals you can draw from biology, but I think that really we probably oughtn't to be drawing any morals from biology. We should just try and think as a society. Yeah. Like I say, about that if instead of us, it was some other species that took over, they will still have the planet in the same status <laughs> as right now. Like here, we're not. Maybe. Only... Yeah. I mean, <laughs> someone asked earlier about why why are we alone? Um, why why uh, do we not see alien civilizations out there? And one theory for this is that well, they all killed each other, killed themselves <laughs> early on because anybody who gets to be that successful is also nasty and likely to kill themselves. Uh, it's a bit of a pessimistic view. Uh, I'd like to think that a society of octopuses would be better than we are, but uh, maybe <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> um, hey guys, it's been one hour and a half. I want to ask Nick if he. Uh more time or is it if you have to... uh, I, I, can, I can I can talk for another 10 or 15 minutes yes maybe now it's time for the hippie questions when we go into deep uh, problems of consciousness and stuff what do you uh, think? yeah okay uh, I, I I really like your 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 approach uh, uh, on on, on life especially in this book the the vital question uh, how does energy how does energy relates to to the issue of consciousness? How do we go from the first prokaryotes to like, you know, talking monkeys wondering about themselves? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I mean, this is something I, I've, I've thought about. I, I wrote a book um, 10 years ago called Life Ascending, uh, which was the subtitle was 10 Great Inventions of Evolution. And I kind of, you know, to, to, to some extent made them up. What, what are they? You, my pick would be different to your pick. They're just interesting questions, but I couldn't leave consciousness out. Um, and that was the chapter that stood alone in the sense that I was I was able to at least hazard a reasonable answer to all the rest of them. Maybe it was not the right answer, but it's not a really bad answer either. But with consciousness, I was just left feeling I've got absolutely no idea. Um, and, and I was left with as well. I read quite, I read more around because partly it was interesting and partly I didn't know so much about it. Um, and I, I was left with the feeling that nobody really knows either. In fact, most people don't really even ask the question. They don't really look at the question. And that's to me is the hard, what's known as the hard problem, yeah. which is what's a feeling um, in physical terms. Uh, and, and, and that seems to engage me as a biochemist more than, so, so, so I can, I, you know, I, all this wiring in, in, in the cerebral cortices, I can see in a, in a robot or in a computer or whatever, you know, it, it's, it's simply wiring complexity. I have no difficulty in understanding how that can come about, but I have difficulty in understanding why I would feel pain. What is a feeling of pain and why is that different or superior to just a kind of circuit algorithm that says, run or do this or do that you know not not why what what is a feeling in biochemical terms and i don't feel as if anybody ever answered that and there's two lines of thought one of them is that it's uh, a concoction of the central nervous system um but that doesn't you know a con what's a concoction is uh, uh, it deluded me into thinking i'm conscious when in fact i'm not um or the other one is a, it's a property of matter which I find even less tasteful because why would a rock not have some state of consciousness? I don't really believe it does, uh, or a star or whatever. So it seems to me to be linked, to our level of consciousness linked to a nervous system and, and not even to all parts of that nervous system, but to only some sections of it. And it seems to be real uh, and it seems to be meaningful biologically. Um, and I was left thinking, I was just talking about bacteria, it gets infected by, by a virus. And, and, and so it helps to kill itself. It knows its genes are absolutely fine, but it's just had a bad luck in life and it's been infected. And now it's going to die. And, and the last action it does is it pulls the plug on the membrane potential. So it's got this charge on the membrane, which is equivalent to a bolt of lightning. Um, and suddenly it goes, zoom. I kind of feel that that must feel like something. You must go. Yeah. <laughs> um, why wouldn't it? Uh, and then I, I thought, and I, I've, I've given lectures on this, but I've never written it up. Uh, I intend to write it up actually sometime, but it'll take me a little while. Um, shrink yourself down to the size of a molecule. You're in a bacterium. Uh, you're an ATP molecule in a bacterium. Where's the other side of the cell? Well, the other side of the cell is 20 kilometers over there. So what links me as a molecule with another ATP molecule 20 kilometers over there? What do we have in common? Why do we think we're part of the same system? The only thing that holds that system together, it seems to me, is the electrical charge on the membrane. Because that's the only thing. It's, it, it generates a field around it by necessity. And that field gives the bacterium entity as an individual. So I suspect that, that the state of the, the charge on the membrane is what the feeling is, that, that it, it goes up or down according to, you know, your state. I've just been infected by a virus now. I pull the plug and I go, mm. but <laughs> maybe, I, maybe if, if there's not enough iron around and I can't generate a high enough membrane potential and I'm only at half buzz, maybe that feels different to being at full buzz. Um, so what it is in my mind is the first step. It says, here is, he, here is a, a status report on how I'm doing as an entity, as a bacterium, um, which all parts of the bacterium can, can feel, are subjected to, which is the field, which is changing continuously and which is a property of the cell as a whole and not a property of a rock or anything else. Uh, and which is a status report on how I'm doing right now in the world right now. Um, 
And that's the beginning of what selection can act on, it seems to me. So you would assign a certain level of, of consciousness even to a bacterium? Yes. Oh. Nothing, nothing oh. sophisticated like a human being, but yes, yeah, not, a level of... Not proprioception. I'm good, but... or I'm not good. <laughs> So, so, yeah, so, maybe, maybe everyone now thinks I'm completely crackers, but uh, yes, because I think the question is, what, what in molecular terms is a feeling? And if in molecular terms a feeling is an electrical field generated by the, 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 the bioenergetic membranes, um, and, and it gives you real-time feedback on, on your state... I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not saying still what a feeling is. I'm just saying a feeling is an, is an electromagnetic field. And that doesn't really say what a feeling is in a meaningful way. I can see that. But at least it links it with, with, a, with a molecular basis in, in real cells that selection can act on and amplify and, and change over time. Where would you draw the line between the conscious and the unconscious? Uh, well, a cell with a membrane potential compared to a cell with no membrane potential that just pulled the plug and is now dead. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would be then the difference between being alive and being conscious? Do you think those two, mm -hmm. like, just because being alive, I, I think of it in terms of being able to get signals from the environment and give them some interpretation and then you respond to them and you learn something about the environment. But then would that be... What would then the difference be with being conscious? Um, well, I think the, the word conscious or consciousness means all things to all people, and that's part of the problem. So all I'm really trying to say is what is a feeling at the simplest possible level? Mm -hmm. So I'm not really saying that a bacterium is conscious in the sense that it, it's got a, a, a mind of its own and it, it, it's thinking, oh, I'm happy today. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, but... I, I, I do think that it's, it's got this kind of real-time status report, which is integrating the whole cell, which is which I don't see why it wouldn't have a feeling attached to it. That if you're doing well or doing badly, that the, the, the actual um, charge varies. Why would that not feel like something? I mean, molecules will align themselves in the molecular field. They, they, you know, everything's going to dance to the tune of this field to some extent. Why would that not feel like something? <laughs> this is this is absolutely blowing my mind this is super interesting and i couldn't stop thinking about actually we saw your lecture on the royal institute uh, uh -huh. during that classic auditorium and i was just oh, thinking yeah. of like My michael faraday finding out it's that a the, very very scary place to give a talk <laughs> it is incredible like the history that has gone through that that place i was like wow yes. So just thinking that Michael Faraday is, you know, showing the world his discoveries of the electromagnetic field and uh, that is something that is propagating through space and then coming back and maybe having a connection with what it means to feel something. Uh, it's fascinating. I, I, I have to think about it, but it's beautiful. I love yes. it. I, I think there's some legs in this idea, but maybe... I, uh, things that I think are really good, sometimes people agree, and most of the time I'm, I'm amazed that they say, ah, no, it's not like that, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so should we expect a new book called like, uh, The Vital Question About Consciousness in the future? Not, not for a while. I'm writing a book at the moment uh, about the Krebs cycle, which is a lot more interesting than it sounds, um, <laughs> but, but it is, uh, it, it's biochemistry which is very difficult to to bring to life i'm quite pleased with what i've done so far and i i, I mean my deadline was last january uh I, I should finish this year and um it's very hard to sex up the krebs cycle i have to say but it it really is it really is interesting material and again it goes from the origin of life what what do you get if you react hydrogen with co2 to drive growth you get krebs cycle intermediates that's what you get And what do you get if you've got mitonuclear incompatibilities that lead to differences between individuals? You get differences in, 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 in the steady state of Krebs cycle intermediates, which, which switch on or off hundreds or thousands of nuclear genes and, and contribute to, to aging and so on. So it's right at the heart of absolutely everything. Um, but it's, it's kind of hardcore biochemistry that I'm doing my best to try and make it, I hesitate to say entertaining, but at least accessible. <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure it's going to be fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading it. Sounds yeah. awesome. I really want to ask you, what do you think is wrong about how they teach us biology in school? Like, uh, wh why people run away from science and from biology? Yes. I mean, I think it's what's wrong with science teaching in school, really, uh, not just biology. Um, and I think the basic problem is not just science either, it's history too, it's, it's the curriculum. Um, and I can understand why there is a curriculum, um, but it, it, it says here is a dusty collection of dry facts that you must all memorize. And who likes memorizing collections of dusty facts, especially if it's about a subject you're not very interested in? It's just, and, and the thing about science, which is so exciting for almost everybody, I think, is it, it's exploration. It, it is finding out about what we don't know. And it, it's, it's how do you think about questions that we don't know the answer to? And how do you, how do you kind of live in a world where everything's flurrying around as a kind of mist of unknowing surrounding you all the time? Uh, that's like being an explorer, and, and, and none of that comes across to, to, uh, to, to school kids who, who just have to remember terms and things. And it's very sad because I think it kills, kills people's love of a, of a subject. Yeah. And what do you recommend to the people, like high school students that are listening right now? If they want to become scientists like you. Well, I would say re read books, uh, listen to interviews like this. I mean, go beyond the curriculum. Do, and, and, and also tr don't try never to just memorize things because it's, I mean, maybe some people enjoy memorizing things, but I think most people probably don't. But the best way to do it is to understand things because understanding is really pleasurable. And, 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 and when the penny drops, and sometimes it takes, for me, a long time for the penny to drop, but when it does, there's this lovely feeling that you, 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 you've got it, you understand. And then you don't need to remember it because it just makes sense. <laughs> so, and that's a, couldn't close with a best, better note than that. This is, has been a pleasure. I, I can't thank you enough, Nick. This has been great. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you. Thank you so much, Nick, for doing this. It, it, it was amazing. It was mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks so, so much. I, I don't know what you're going to put online because I'm sure you, you need to trim that down quite a lot. I'm sorry if I... No, I mean... Uh, no, but people are really patient with us. Uh, we're just going to yes. settle this and, 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 and let them let him. Well, that's to... a big job in itself. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And this has been the interview for our English listeners. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, para la gente que nos escucha en español, muchas gracias por haber venido. Es, eh, no sé, no sé qué decir. Uh, algunos comentarios finales. Creo que fue una experiencia increíble hablar con... Pensar que las personas que tienen estos pensamientos tan profundos y que están haciendo muchas cosas muy innovadoras son totalmente humanos, ¿no? O sea, con las mismas preguntas y cuestiones y nada más siguiendo esa curiosidad al, al extremo es bastante inspirador. Sí. Algo que yo diría es que Bill Gates recomendó este libro y de hecho está en la carátula del libro que es pues, como uno de sus libros favoritos y le gustó tanto que terminó entrevistando al mismo Nick Lane mm. y yo tuve la misma experiencia de pronto todos nosotros que estudiamos o yo estudio biología en la universidad pero siento que leer este libro fue como, me hizo pensar esto es lo que debería haber visto en la primera el primer día, la primera materia que vi en la carrera, porque a pesar sí. de que puedes ver biología en la escuela o puedes ver biología en la universidad, pero realmente los conceptos que presenta este libro creo que son claves para cualquier persona que esté interesada en biología o en entender un poco más como el tema de orígenes de la vida que es fascinante, pero también abarca tantas cosas que yo creo que es una lectura básica y fundamental para cualquier persona en general interesada en ciencia. Curiosa, personas curiosas. Sí, a mí me encanta porque creo que es su forma de pensar es muy, um, es un, en cierto sentido contrario a lo que a como aprendemos en la escuela, como él mencionó, de, aprendemos un montón de tecnicismos y conceptos, y es pura memorización, pero en realidad eso es muy aburrido y eso es súper ineficiente y no le sirve a nadie. Lo interesante es contar la historia 
de cómo es que estamos aquí, cómo es que tenemos todas estas propiedades, cómo es que nos reproducimos, morimos, etc. Como toda esa historia te hace entender un montón de cosas, no solamente en biología, sino en general del mundo, ¿no? Entonces está... Sí, no, fue, fue, fue genial. Y pues muchas gracias a, a ti, Pepe, y a, y a tu audiencia. Eh, ojalá que a la gente le guste. Sí, ojalá. Muchas gracias a los 600 que se quedaron por acá. Este, Me gustó mucho lo que dijo al final, fíjate. Este, esta idea de que eh, no hace falta memorizar, sino entender. Y una vez que entiendes, pues no tienes que memorizar nada, porque simplemente simplemente tiene sentido, ¿no? Eh, acerca de el placer de entender cosas. Y creo que es muy importante, ¿no? Eh, en el momento, porque, no sé, yo siempre di la escuela, cada segundo de ella, cada, cada momento, cada, cada día, eh, porque no había este approach, esta, esta, esta idea de que las cosas y tecnicismos que estoy aprendiendo en papel están relacionados con mi vida, pero de la manera más profunda. Eh, ese, ese, nunca lo había visto así, nunca lo había escuchado en palabras, el placer de entender algo, es, es, está bien interesante. Sí, sí, creo que se nota, o sea, que es un pensador no lleno nada más de tecnicismo, sino de que reflexiona sobre tanto su propia vida, el significado de lo que él está haciendo y las consecuencias de sus propuestas e hipótesis de cómo interpretamos nuestra propia existencia. Entonces, no, fue un gran, una gran, gran honor haber tenido la oportunidad de hablar uh, con alguien como él. Como dijo Dani, tú puedes buscar sus entrevistas con Bill Gates y está así como hablando con la élite intelectual del mundo, y aquí se pasó dos horas con nosotros. Entonces, qué, sí. qué placer, qué, qué increíble experiencia. Sí, la sí, verdad no. fue un honor. Muchas gracias por acompañarme. Sí, o sea, dio una plática, o sea, es alguien que dio una plática hace un tiempo en la Royal Society, o sea, donde estuvo, no sé, sí. tantas, tantas figuras de la historia de la ciencia, y aquí lo tenemos en, en mi gala. En Zoom, sí. En mi gala, <risa> exacto. Pues bueno, <risa> sale fue bueno, amigos, ha sido un placer. Muchas gracias a todos los que se quedaron. Este, Amigos, gracias por hacer esto posible. Eh, no, no habría sido... Eh, no habríamos podido hacer esto sin, sin ustedes. Gracias. Y pues ojalá bueno. que vengan más cosas. A ver qué tal. A ver qué tal. Eh, esperen, amigos. Y eso fue todo por el momento. Muchas gracias. Ah, nos vemos en la noche. En la noche tenemos podcast. Y este, en estos días vamos a estar subiendo los subtítulos de, de esta entrevista para todos los que los que quieran leerla en español. Alguien por aquí está diciendo que en la comunidad bonóbica subirán la entrevista completa doblada al español. Por favor, no lo hagas con la voz del triple R, pero, pero si, la, si la doblas al español, eso estaría chingón. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno. Quien tenga el link de la comunidad bonóbica, este, por favor, compártela en, en, el, en el chat para, para que todos podamos verla. Y si no, este, pues ya la estaremos compartiendo por medio de las redes. Este, amigos, muchas gracias. Ha sido un placer. Y a la gente de YouTube, hasta luego. Nos vemos en la noche. Bye. Bye. Que sea Mario Castañeda quien doble a Nick. Sí, de Canal 5, güey, así. <risa> ¿Qué?